Well, hello again, friends. It's time for our third part of our personal finance lecture series. And now we're going to look at the culture of debt. And again, we use some strategies on the second video of how to get a credit score. So yes, a credit card is very important. Your credit score is one of the most important numbers you will need in your personal finance life, so to speak. And that gets you, you know, the best interest rates. Now, unfortunately, we have been living in a sea of debt for most Americans. And we kind of know why, because not able to spend as much money, not making as much money, uh, and because they're not paid as much money. So, you left off, the borrower is servant to the lender. Let's take a look at this. Yikes. Look at that number. $1.7 trillion. That's where it's headed. It's at like 1.6777 right now. Um, look at 2003, 2004. It's about two to three hundred billion dollars. Now, that is a cumulative amount. So anyone who went to college before 2003, 2004, all right, maybe your parents, okay, grandparents, other people, that's the total. Now just look at that red line right there. It's as it's just about going up in a vertical, like a 45 degree angle. Uh, it is now $1.7 trillion, my friends. Thank goodness, all right, you are at Tarrant County College. You take every single course that you can here before you transfer. And then figure out ways to take more classes, okay? Uh, hey, we have seven universities in this area. I know it's a, we all wish we had the college life of living in a dorm and going to football games and just partying like crazy. Uh, that may not happen for us. If you can live at home, again, because that's an extra 20 grand a year when you live on campus, depending on what school you go to. So there's lots of online programs. We've got to figure out this number, my friends. The average student graduates with $35,000 worth of college loans. Actually, that number is 37 now. And $10,000 worth of credit card debt. Yikes, yikes. And for years, we would go hopefully get a job. I mean, we, we certainly hope so for everyone, the job they want, and go buy a brand new car, you know, a nice Honda Accord or, you know, something along that lines and, and get another 30-something thousand in debt. And all of a sudden, we're, our debts are piling up. Not a good number here. 50% of all college loans are in deferral. To be in deferral means you do not have a full-time job. Okay. Uh, yikes. 8% interest. This is what gets me so upset. And I know you're, you're, you're wondering what makes Randy mad. This is another thing. Hey, I ain't got no debt, but I don't want you to have it. And, and I'm just tired of what we're doing to college students. 8%. Remember the rule of 72? Divide 72 by 8, you get 9. That number doubles. So that 35000 if I'm in deferral and making very minimal payments, goes to seventy grand in 9 years. There is no reason for a college student to have to pay any interest on their loan, if I were president. Okay, take all the interest off. Yes, pay back what you borrowed. Okay, we can, we can have a meeting of the minds there. But let's not just tack on interest to double and triple these loans. Okay, let me go on. Student loans. 56% of all Texas college students will have a balance when they walk across that stage of $37,000. Now, that's pretty low side. Hey, when a... You just start today, as some of you have started. This is your first year in your college degree. If you started, let's say at uh, you know Texas Tech, A and M, somewhere off where you had to basically have room and board, you would be looking at thirty thousand dollars a year. And if you were fortunate enough to get out in four years, that would be a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. If you went to a private school such as TCU or SMU. Just the tuition alone at TCU is over, will be over $50,000 starting in the fall. That's living at home, no, no, no t-shirts, nothing else. Uh, SMU is even more expensive. I believe it's like 60 or 65. 
$200,000 worth of debt. And then if you lived on campus, again, another, another 17 to 20 grand. It's crazy, my friends. It's crazy. Be careful. Tarrant County College is a direct loan institution, which means you can borrow the full Stafford amount of $5,500. We cannot tell you no. We just you say, as long as you have, I believe you have to be in nine hours of classes. There you go. Hey, I'm going to use this money for my car expenses. Uh, I'm going to fix some stuff up because uh, maybe it's at 6% and it's better than a credit card, 25% interest rate. So I'm going to do it. That, that gets some students in some trouble. We, we have had a few students who have ended their career at Tarrant County College with fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 of debt because they took out these loans every semester or every year and uh, we're in here a little bit too much in fact I think that's you can do that for a total semester so they were hitting 5500 every semester so let's not do that you know if you have to borrow okay I get it but just what you need for your classes uh, again especially when you get to your bachelor degree uh, degree program if that's your end game um, they will give you they will say your need is more than just tuition and fees because you have living expenses, travel expenses, and so you may qualify for the entire loan uh, and you've got extra money in your pocket, which is hard. It's hard to say no to that, right? It's in your bank account. You're liking that. Send it back. You can send that remainder of the check once your tuition and fees are paid for and send it back because, uh, again, this is some bad stuff coming our way. Okay. All right. Borrow some money for your education. I'm not saying not to do that. You've got to come up with a figure in your head that you and your family discuss. Okay, um, is it is thirty thousand reasonable for your four year degree? Everything out. That's that. That's not a bad rate. In fact, that's under the average. Maybe it's going to be sixty thousand. Pick the number. So let's look at those two numbers right there. So there we are. It's six point eight percent interest. Okay, which is just too much. Uh, when you know corporations today are getting bailed out by the government and paying zero percent interest, banks have to pay no interest to the Federal Reserve or the Treasury Department, and yet they loan it out for eighteen uh, percent. All right, Randy, get back on drag. Let's see. This is a standard payment right in here. Ten years, one hundred and twenty payments. If you have a thirty thousand dollar loan monthly, you'll pay three hundred and forty six dollars. That's that's a pretty good amount, my friends. Your total payback is forty one four. You had eleven four thirty as your interest charges. Okay, again, I think you should just have to pay that back. Sixty grand. Okay, it's six ninety one a month. Ooh, that's a that's a tough note, you know. And you have to start paying these loans back six months after you cease to go to college. So either you graduate or you terminate your college uh, degree. Six months later, you're going to get some uh, letter saying it's time to pay back that federal student loan. Eighty-two thousand is what you pay back, and you've been charged twenty-two thousand, twenty-three thousand dollars worth of interest. But friends, people don't do. That's just the normal. When someone says, "Hey, you know what? We can extend that loan for 20, 20 years," okay, and so instead of one hundred and twenty payments, now you're at almost three hundred payments. Okay, so we're going to take thirty thousand dollars. It's only two hundred dollars a month. Okay. All right, that's better than 346. You can maybe handle that. But look at the payback. You've doubled the loan. You have paid back more interest than you did actually take out of the 30,000. 60,000? 417 a month. Well, that sounds better than 700. You pay back 125. Again, you have basically doubled your loan. And that's what so many students are doing because they just like that lower payment. Now, that's normal. Normal gets you broke. Normal does not help your financial career, your financial plan out at all. And of course, there's so much students right now, you know, you're, you're killing our dreams. We're smart. We've got TCC. Let's be, let's not be normal. Let's be ruthless. Okay. Sure. Take that loan, but tell yourself, I'm going to ruthlessly pay this back. So you graduate. If you are able to still live at home, you know, I've told you that all semester. Never leave until you are ready to have, you know, you got a great emergency fund of ten grand, and all your debts are paid off. And add the cost of rent to your loan payment. Check it out. So, same amount, same standard loan. Okay. But we're going to be doing something like this. There's your 346 a month. 
what if you added the cost of rent, $600, which would be like if you were basically maybe rooming, because we know rent is closer to 900 to 1,000. Wow, if you could put 1,000 extra in that, you're killing it. Even if you did 600, 946 is your new payment. You know what you will have done? You will have paid this back in three years. Not 10, but three. You'll save $8,000 worth of interest because you've only paid 33 back. But you know what we really saved? We really saved $30,000 worth of interest because I'm basing that on the extended 20-year loan. That's, that's great. Three years, you're done. You got the rest of your life. What about the, what, what about the $60,000? Same thing. You had $691 a month on the 10-year loan. Put $600 extra, $1,291. You have paid that back in four and a half years versus 20 years. So you really saved, I mean, nominally you would save $13,000 worth of interest because it's on a 10-year loan, but we know that's being financed on a 20-year note. So you save 56 grand, you only paid 69 total. Now, if you want to get more traction, make that $1,000, your full cost of rent. Maybe you pay mom and dad something. Say, hey, mom and dad, this is what I want. And if you'll help me, I, I want to get out, get my life going because I want to buy a home. I want to buy a nicer car. I want to have a life. There are loans out there over two and three and four hundred thousand dollars. I've seen some of the million dollars. Those were dentists. And you just can't pay. <laughs> yeah, dentist is not going to pay back a million dollar loan. Maybe a brain neurosurgeon could. Maybe. Um, so I think that gives you a strategy that's in your binder. Take that and that's how you pay it back ruthlessly. And that's what we want to do with our debts. It is a culture of debt. This whole millennia has been a culture of debt, my friends. Again, for the reasons that we have seen in this class when we put all the dots together from that first unit. When we see that hardworking Americans are just not getting paid a real rate of, of pay. You know, they should be making so much more. So since 2000, and even people who have done well, and we're talking those $100,000 incomes and above, have spent close to 120% of their take-home pay. It's happening. It happened. It kind of stopped a little bit during our recessionary times, but it went right back up. Some of it because people just had to. They had, they had to eat. They had to put clothes on their back and get their, and get their kids uh, you know, set up as well. Typical American household has $54,000 of consumer debt. That's car and credit cards, okay? Investment debt is different. That's your mortgage. That's backed. That, that's appreciating. This is stuff that can just be taken away. It's unsecured. Yeah, that is the debt profile. Somewhat in the averages, $18,000 of a household, $60,000 of student loan debt, because that could be a couple right there. And of course, unfortunately, for you Zesters, the, the student loan debt is just getting more and more expensive. Please. I hope you've uh, learned a few things from this lesson already and from, from the class. Uh, a college education, definitely need it. It just ain't worth over 100 grand. Sorry, it's not. Uh, not a debt. We, we got to get those numbers lower. Average car debt, 35, 113 grand just of servicing debts. Okay, now you want to buy that home. Now you want to you have a life. You got to have food. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Oh, great, more good news. Since about 2007, again, that's right about that time that recession was just starting to take hold. It's, it's close to two to three trillion dollars worth of home equity loans. They're called a, a HEL loan, H-E-L, home equity loan. And I don't have to tell you, there's always going to be stress in a marriage for those of you who are considering or are married. And it gets unbearable sometimes when the finances just don't make it, when there's just too much month left at the end of that money. You know, you got another week left to go for the month and, and you just need a paycheck really bad, but you're not going to get that for six or seven, eight more days. So, number one, pretty much number one factor of divorces. The culture of debt. Hey, are these companies, you know, are these our friends? Well, we need one, all right? We're going to start our strategy, so I don't want to be conflicting. We're using this for a strategy to build the credit score so we get the lowest interest on any of our debt. These companies know what they're doing. Almost every year for the past 30 years, they put $100 million just into advertising and marketing. Okay, Lobbyists try to get credit cards in everyone's hand. 
uh, a few years ago, the credit card companies were on every college campus between University of Texas and then look at University of Oklahoma, you know, very well-known schools, Capital One paid each school two million dollars just to be on campus for the first two weeks of the fall and spring semester. They usually have their tents and they were giving out free applications to get your first credit card. That's all they wanted for two million bucks per school. Uh, and every other school you know, was paid as well, not just those two, just to give you an example. Why? Well, think about this. There is tremendous psychology here. How many of you still have the first credit card that was issued to you? That's about what I thought, at least half of you. Yeah. Uh, it's like, wow, somebody believed in me. And of course, you know you're screwed once you get that first credit card, even if it's $500 balance, uh, credit limit. <laughs> you hit a store and I'll take that, I'll take that, I'll take that, until you basically run your limit up. Uh, it's just, you know, it's some new experience. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the month, oh, I got to pay that back? Oh, no. So their rewards, I mean, their efforts have been rewarded. Net profits to these companies are $30 billion a year. That's after all expenses are paid, okay? So you know that if you're an amazing company and you can get a 10% net profit return off your gross sales, well, that'd be $300 billion worth of, worth of, worth of charges uh, from those companies, uh, from, from consumers for Visa, for MasterCard, for American Express. Uh, for Discover. That's a huge number, my friends. These guys are not easy to play with and they're not easy to beat unless we strategize like I have told you here. Here's the rules of engagement. Yeah, it's hard to beat them at their game. 90 days, same as cash. You're going to run across all these offers, especially during Christmas and of course right now. Uh, I think organizations are going to do anything to get you to buy again. Six months, no interest will get you burned, you know. 84% of the time, those consumers get nailed with backdated interest. Now, some of us who have credit for a while, we do it. Okay, six months, no interest, no payments. But if you haven't paid the total back, by the end of that sixth month, you get backdated with all the interest from day one. And again, 84% of the time, these companies win, which means they get backdated interest. I think Las Vegas has a, like a 67% rate of winning or 71%. This is better than gambling here, better than, better than Las Vegas odds. Now, many of you know who Senator Elizabeth Warren is. She ran for president. Uh, before she became senator in Massachusetts, she was a professor at Harvard University Law School. And her specialty was bankruptcy law. And she basically asked some of her best students every semester who are graduating you give them the credit card, you know, statements and say, you know, I'll, I'll give you a full week. You tell me how the interest is charged, how much, when it's charged, you know, what's the payoff, if you paid it all up. You know, a litany of questions. And these were her best. I mean, come on, this is Harvard. Supposed to be the best law students in the world. They came back in a week. They called her, you know, they said, I, I need some help, need some help. They couldn't figure it out. And so she berated them up and down. I can't believe I'm sending you out there and you can't tell me how these guys play the game. And then after that, she would say, well, guess what? I don't know either. I've tried it and I never get the same numbers. I never get the same um, answer from these cards either. They say, oh, well, it's kind of like this. And then she does the calculations. No, it would be, then it would be this amount. Oh, well, it's a little bit different. Elizabeth Warren is one of the, the few senators who has, uh, she literally rewrote the bankruptcy laws because they were so egregious to consumers. She's one of the few that really had the consumer in mind. And so let's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, let's hope she, she keeps fighting for us because very few Congress people are fighting for us at all. But there it is. 30% of these profits come from late fees. That means they have to do absolutely nothing. So there's $10 billion of that 30. You know, we're talking about 30 billion of profit, 10 billion come from late fees. That's because you just missed the date. And of course, if you've over, oh, we have an over the limit fee as well. So this is nothing that the institution there, these corporations have to do to gain that money. They're not lending you any more money, not doing anything different. They're just charging the late fees. They literally want you to be late. That's how they make their money.
you would think that their target market would be somebody who is a good credit worthy person, pays their debt, debts on time, and which they can extend a lot of credit to, a $5,000 credit limit, and, and going to pay back every, every month. Now, that is some of their customers, but their real target this entire past 20 years, maybe even late 90s, have been someone who's living on the edge, okay, who doesn't have the best income, who they can charge the highest interest rates, they know they're going to get late fees, and they're going to get overextended fees, and they want that to be late. That's been their target customer. They are preying upon people, and they're not praying for you. They are preying on you like a praying mantis would. Now, Let's talk about some of the insanity in credit cards. Do you need one? Yes. We just cannot get sucked into what they want to offer all the time. People would say this, hey, you know what? There's a GM card out there. If we will take in a year, you'll get a 5% off on a brand new General Motors car if you use our credit card. Well, let's just do some math. You know, you'd have to, to get $4,000 worth of rebate. You'd have to spend $80,000 on that card. That's a real winner. Okay, and then you get the brand new General Motors car, and as soon as you take it off the lot, you know, say if it's, it's not a truck or something, you know, it's just a standard car, you just lost $6,000 when you drove it off that parking lot. That's not a good deal, my friends. I hear this all the time. I put everything on my credit card, and then I pay it off at the end of the month, and I get all of my points and my airline miles. And sometimes that does work for people, but Unless you have that money already in the bank and, and you're really rolling and you've got a fifty, you know, twenty-five thousand dollar emergency fund, don't do that because it's so easy to miss the wrong payment dates and get nailed with lots of interest. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, I like that. That's that's it. You just moved out. This is your apartment, and we have this great video room. All right, we're binging. $10,000. We're going to go low side for you, all right? You, you got the ultimate home theater, and you put it on your Best Buy credit card or your Amazon re rewards card, and they came, and they set it all up. We have Bose speakers, and it's just beautiful right there. How much and how long did it take to pay that off? You got a 13% interest rate they gave you. 13% is a very good rate, my friends, and you're paying $150 a month. That's, that's a sizable payment for a credit card. How long will it take you to pay that thing off? I get all sorts of answers. You know, is it five years? Is it seven years? And how much do you end up paying back? At 13% interest, you will take you 10 years to pay that beautiful home theater off in $18,000. Here's what's interesting. In five and a half years, you would have paid the money off had it not been an interest rate. So for four and a half years, you're paying $8,000 worth of interest. So, so many companies, when they hit consumers up because they default on them, saying that, you know, you haven't paid everything back. Well, they probably did pay it back. They probably paid the original amount back. And now we're getting sued because we didn't give them all the interest. All right, that's just, that's just game theory. It's, it's what you get into. But let's say you didn't have a 13% interest rate. Let's say you had an 18% interest rate card. Look what happens. You're still paying 150 a month. Okay. You paid it for 30 years now. 30 freaking years. And you paid $54,000. Friends, the same math works here. In five and a half years, you paid your $10,000. You have been working 24 and a half years of paying. 40, uh, some, some odd, forty-four thousand dollars worth of interest, but you don't have an eighteen percent card. You have a see there you are twenty-four and a half years, forty-four grand of interest. You have a twenty-nine percent card. That's your interest rate. Actually, one hundred and fifty would not compute because you'd be dead. Sorry, it is it's over a hundred years. So the math what you'd have to do is pay three hundred dollars a month, and it still comes out to thirty years and sixty thousand dollars. Just an interesting little setting right there. I think that's actually a test question, too. 10 years, 18,000 on that ultimate home theater. Uh, hey, how does this theater look after five years? Technology is all outdated. <laughs> you know, you can't sell it, you can't give it away. You better hope you have that home, too. Interesting, my friends. You know what? 
I do believe that this terrible pandemic that we're in will, will, will be a readjustment for many of us to say, you know what, I just need some of the basics in life. I don't need a lot of this crap, uh, but I do need my food. I do need my health. And uh, I, I think we're going to see consumerism become very different uh, as we get through this uh, absolute craziness of the world. Oh dear. Oh dear. Now I usually ask students, hey, raise your hand. No, I never ask you. How many of you have heard of payday loans? Do not raise your hand. Then somebody raised their hand. Yeah, I've done one of those. Uh, these are scum of the earth, my friends. They, they are. That, that, there's no other way to, to describe them. They are the worst loans possible. You, you know, my gosh, man. Uh, if you need some money that bad, uh, mow grass, paint a house, do the difficult, but never go to these losers. There's more of these in the United States right now than there are Burger King's, Wendy's, and McDonald's combined. And these are relatively new. There's almost like 40,000 of them. And they just came in the early aughts, okay? That's when they started coming. Here's how it works. I go in, all right? Let's say it was, it was March 20th or 21st, and I'm looking at my bank account, and it's got like four dollars in it. I said, oh my god, I, I got it. I, I need at least I need at least 300 bucks. You know, I could get through uh, the next couple of weeks. I'm going to be tough and tight, but that's all I need. Uh, and I can't find anybody. My credit's messed up, and I don't have an emergency fund, so I go to one of these places. What they would do, now Richard is my payday loan lender. Thank you, Richard. And he says, all right, Randy, here's what I do. I'm going to take your debit card, I'm going to give you three. First, I'm going to count out 300 in cash for you. And he stacks it in 20, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. And he said, now, here's your credit card, your debit card right here. I am going to hit this up on April 1st or April 2nd, two weeks, for $350. So he charges me a $50 fee for that. If that's all I ever did, the interest rate is between seven and nine hundred percent yield for them. Is that a good interest rate to have? Because you annualize that and then you figure out what two weeks is worth. That is crazy. Unfortunately, I did get paid, but I really don't want to uh, get three hundred and fifty tapped up. And I say, Hey, Rich, man, can you handle me? Can you can can uh, can I go another month? And he says, Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Okay, but. I'll be happy to. May 1st, you, you pay this back. But i got to get you another $50 fee and a late fee. So now, the $300 I borrowed, I have $150 worth of interest charges. And unfortunately, it gets into a terrible cycle. These people have no, I don't know what the word is, indemnity, I guess. I mean, there's nothing. You can not, Bankruptcy does nothing for these. They keep, pay, they keep charging every month the interest to them. There's no statute of limitations that they can't hide that that you can uh, protect yourself from. They are they will come at you. There's been a many a many a person who's taken out just a few hundred dollars of loans and ended up paying ten thousand dollars back because that was their rate. And the government does nothing to regulate them. Well, the only thing they did do again because it was Elizabeth Warren that said, "Look, these are right next to most military installations and bases across the United States, and for young." Uh, you know, service people who need the money to send back to home. Uh, they're their only bank and, and th uh, they're getting so much debt. You know, they're losing their security clearances. And so they, they had to back them off like a couple of miles. That, that's it. Yikes. If you want to be broke, just take out a loan. It, it, do I need to go on? I don't think so. Yeah, absolutely. Never, never mess with those. Co-signing a loan is not much better. All right, but it is a great it's a great way to give a friend some money because you'll never they'll never pay it back. Here's what co-signing does. Somebody needs to be co-signed. Now, again, I've co-signed for my daughter uh, for a credit card. That's that's different, you know, when you have for your for your family. Be careful on your family. I mean, like your immediate like your children maybe. Uh, and then let them get their credit back up. But if a friend comes up to you, okay, and says uh, Lisa says, you know, hey, Randy, I, I need to just co-sign for my car. I need a new car. Oh, yeah, all I got to do is put my signature. Well, I'll be happy to do that. And so uh, what I've just done is I've accepted, I'm the guarantor of that loan. I accept full responsibility. Four or five months later, 
Honda calls me and says, hey, Mr. Sal, uh, right? Yeah, good. Glad I got you. Um, you owe us $24,000 and for a $17,000 car that was purchased by a girl named Lisa that you co-signed for. Oh no, no, man, Lisa, she's uh let me see. Let me let me let me let me uh, let me troll her Instagram real quick. Oh, she's in Mexico. Oh, she's having a good time down in Mexico uh, on the beach it looks like. I I can get so we don't care. <laughs> we don't care. We don't care where she is. You basically said you would be the guarantor. Uh, and so we are putting liens against your you know, because we're never going to find Lisa again, uh, against your assets, your bank account, which you as, as you pledged as collateral. And so we're calling the loan in right now. Do you see why you never want to do it? You're legally responsible for that debt. Never insure somebody else's debt, my friends. It's just a great way to grow, to grow, to go broke and to ruin your credit score. I'm sorry, mama. I can't go sign for you anymore. Car debt. Let's look at it. You know, we're conditioned, it's psychology to believe that we always have a car payment throughout our lives. And hey man, I look at that uh, student parking lot, there's a lot of nice cars out there. There's more nice cars, uh, and, they're, <laughs> and most of them are not faculty. So, we love our cars. This is America. I mean, we're, we're, we're a car nation. The average car payment, I just checked it out today, for a new car is $550 a month. For a used car, four hundred. Wow, that means interest rates are pretty are pretty high for the used car market too. And if you're leasing a car, which to me is just, you know, maybe maybe you found a way to make it work, but at least you're getting something for that car when you pay it off. You get nothing for that. I mean, you get the use of the car, but you don't have. You, there's no equity ever built up. So, wow, do we want to hit that the rest of our lives? Just interesting, right in here. If let's just say we had four hundred and you invested four hundred a month at twelve percent interest for forty, you'd have over four million dollars. Again, what if the market tanked and went back? You'd have probably two million dollars. That's how much those cars are costing us. Yes, yes, enjoy that car. Now, according to Consumer Reports, which I think is one of the best magazines you could ever get, because it's all about the consumer and how not to get you know pushed around. In the marketplace, so it's great for personal finance, uh, and it's just it's a good magazine. They don't take any type of corporate money. They buy every car they test. They buy every product they have. They'll resell the cars, but they take they take no money from anyone. They are independent as can be. So, according to this agency, a new car will lose sixty percent. Now we're not talking about a truck because trucks do uh, hold their money, hold, hold their value. But a new car will lose 60% of its value in four years. So let's check this example out. A new car, say you buy a $28,000 car, you're going to lose 17 grand in four years. So now after a, four years, it's worth $11,000. And you may not have paid the car off yet. You're losing $350 a month in value. Now we haven't even talked about the full cost of car ownership because then all of a sudden there's insurance, there's gas, uh, there's depreciation. And so it's it's seven sixty a month. So if you want to go out and buy a new car to get an I to get a feeling of, of how much you're losing just on the car value for a brand new one, do this. Every Friday, when you buy your new car, every Friday, drive around, unroll your window, and throw out a hundred dollar bill and just throw it out the window. That's about the effect you're getting. Now nobody would do that, right? But yet we are. Friends, do not buy a new car always look at buying a good used three to four year old car let someone else take all that depreciation hit and you get a better deal for it and take a little extra money and if it needs the tune-ups and get it serviced take it to a good mechanic and have it looked at before you buy it the truth about our toys there we go a toy is anything like this oh and there's my there's my uh wet bike jet ski oh, and that beautiful oh my bash boat man i need that my kick-ass motorcycle brand new car all of these lose value. They all depreciate. Cars depreciate. Now, maybe you buy that new Bentley. Okay, that's only 300 grand. The grand total of your toys, this is something in a wealth building plan, should never be more than 50% of your annual income. So, if you make, you know, driving that $45,000 we gave you for that job, and you're driving a $30,000 car, Oof, that's that's going to have negative net worth for you because this is depreciating, okay? 
it, it's going to be worth eleven thousand in four years or fourteen thousand. It's going to lose. Yeah, it's going to lose that much. It'd be worth about twelve thousand in four years, and more than likely, we may be making just you know maybe fifty thousand at that point. Don't let this happen. You buy brand new stuff when you have a million dollars worth of assets because then the why I'm saying that is you can afford to take the depreciation hit. It's not going to hurt you that bad. But when we're just making a good income, it, it it's killer. What about a house? That's debt. And that's great debt though, I think. Now, hopefully. I mean, owning a home is the best investment you can make. And right now, interest rates are just about as low as they're ever going to be because they're at 0% for the for uh, the bond market and for invest for uh, for banks to, to borrow. And so you can get some great savings right now. And it could be a, a very good time to refinance if, if, if necessary. Here's the thing. Don't buy more house than you can afford. The total payment, taxes, insurance, and monthly upkeep of your home should not be more than 35% of your take-home can pay. So we're also talking taxes and insurance, okay, and monthly upkeep. Hey, my father always said, son, this is the joys of home ownership. That water heater goes bad. Okay, that's $1,000 just to get, re, re, you know, uh, for a plumber to come in and fix it. Not fix it, but put a new one in. Dishwasher, refrigerator, you need new carpet, you need to paint the house. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the houses are expensive to upkeep. And if you're one of those people that say, I don't care about a house, I don't want all that mess, I, I want to live in an apartment, I think that's fine. Uh, people say, you know, that you're throwing money away in an apartment. Well, you're getting value. You are, you know, you are living there. It is yours. And you can move and you can, don't have to worry about cleaning the yard up and you can do what you want to do. So if that's, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. This does tend to be the pinnacle, all right, the backbone of all your assets for your financial plan because these will appreciate in value. But just don't take out so much. And if you look at, well, what should it be on my ha household income? You know, if, when you do not go over two and a half times your average household income, okay? Which means if you're a $50,000 income, your mortgage would be at one twenty-five. dollars okay? Now, you may have some other monies you put a big down payment on. Maybe you've had a small house before, and then you you flipped it, and you got money. And so it's the mortgage amount, Okay? Not necessarily the, the the house, the price of the house. Uh, Eighty thousand dollar income, a two hundred thousand uh, mortgage max. Again, you need money for other things, not just a house and not just a car. Hope that helps you. All right, what are some of the wealthiest people? And I'm looking at that from the book, The Millionaire Next Door. We're not we're not talking about people who's been born into wealth or who just got it real quick uh, that they you know, worked very hard and accumulated their money. And they said, you know what, what we try to do is uh, we don't use debt for paying purchases, okay? We, we become debt free and stay that way. So, one of our steps is let's stop using that credit card to pay for our major purchases so we don't have to pay for it more than once with those heavy interest rates, all right? See if that strategy works. Stop, save the money up, then buy that product, that car, that thing you need. What if we get into some debt problems? Well, we are. I mean, this is going to happen. Different times of your life, especially when you're younger and you start out. Let's look what we can do. Our first step, always in that financial plan, my friends, is to gain one to three thousand dollars cash as emergency fund. This is not for purchasing as much as it is for those emergencies. Okay, that way I don't have to pull that credit card out when something bad happens. So, and again, right now and through the United States. Uh, if if the consumers had three to five to ten thousand dollars worth of emergencies, we could we could get through some of this craziness uh, uh, of of losing the job and not uh, not panicking so quickly. So, all right, we have an emergency fund built up. Now we're going to start trying to get rid of that debt. Now here's what's called a debt snowball. Uh, Dave Ramsey uses this a lot in his seminars, and uh, Larry Burkett was one of the first people to really construct a debt snowball and, and use this to give it away to, to, to people. So, small debts first. We're just trying to pay off uh, the fastest way possible. We're not really concerned with interest rates. We want to develop some intensity and some focus. Okay? So, here's the plan. And again, I have these in the binder for you. And I have uh, one that is uh, basically Free? I mean, they're all free for you. Uh, there, there's a blank one. So, let's say I have a Dillard's right in here. 
Dillard's $200 total payoff. All right. Nordstrom's $500. Visa 1000 car 8500 That's how I am listing everything from top to bottom. Okay. Not concerned about the interest rates because this may have a lower interest rate than the Dillard's. Let's start paying stuff off. Wow. My minimum payments I'm going to line up. 20 for the Dillard's. 55 for the Nordstrom, 60 for the Visa. These are minimum payments, and 289 for my little old car right there. Here's what we do. We pay something off. Let's just say you found some extra money. You started selling stuff on eBay or Amazon. Probably eBay's even better. And you got, and you said, I'm paying that Dillard's off. Great. So once you pay off a card, traditionally, we just go back and spend more money on it. Pay it off. Put the minimum payment, roll it in to the next payment. So 20 and 55 is now $75, okay? It was $550, $75 now. I have 10 payments left. Great uh, remaining. So, oh, actually, when I change the, the number, it will go down to seven payments. So, you had 10 originally. You pay this one off. What do we do again? We take, once this is paid off, and again, maybe you find some other stuff to sell, you get an extra job, that business idea is coming through, and now you're making money off of it, and you can pay debts down faster, how fantastic. You take this 75, 60, and you roll the new payment in, okay? So now we're paying 135 a month, okay? And we've just shortened our payments quite a bit because you're, you're, tack, you're tackling this with intensity. Same thing on the car, all right? You had 289, and we rolled in the 135, which gives us $424, and 15 payments remain. Whoa, we are killing it. If we just did the normal thing, we would have 57 payments in place. Utilizing the debt snowball required no extra money, okay? Uh, Maybe may the first time to pay that dealer's off. But we're just using the money that we had. Okay, it went down to four D payments. That's that's a year and a half right there. Wow, we paid it back everything a year early, and we saved seventeen payments, more than a year. What if we put in a little extra money on that? Here's what we did: you attack those small debts first, and you maintain minimums on everything else, and then you roll it into the next larger bill. And you just get uh, you, you get an attack mode. If you put an extra hundred bucks in there, you you could pay it off even faster. Now at the end we were paying four twenty four. Whoa! Since we were doing that, and now we got our debts down to to very little zero. Okay, we, we're still paying the mortgage. We're still paying bigger stuff. What if you took that four twenty four and you put it into your emergency fund? Within two more years, you'd have you'd have over 10 grand. And if you had a couple grand in there before, you see how it works? You see how it works? That is an effort. Under four years, hey, it, it didn't happen overnight. Sometimes we, we get ourselves in different situations. Just like we did in the paying off our college loans, we just got crazy on it. We paid off $12,000 worth of debt, saved an extra 10 grand, $22,000. Again, if there was a way to add an extra 50, 100, $200 to that mix, you could, you could do it even faster. You now have the discipline and the foundation to build some wealth. So use the debt snowball when you have debts that you think that, oh my gosh, man, they're really, they're getting to me. Uh, I don't know what to do. That'll pay it off. And then you can start saving. Hey, what about if things go bad? They do. There's different times of famine in our lives, my friends. Okay, if it gets really bad, well, first thing, we've got to get on that written budget. That's why we have it there for you. Contact your creditors. Maybe let them know that I cannot make all my payments. Um, most of us have bill pay. Uh, even if keep that account active. Uh, sometimes if I don't, if you don't have enough, what if you put five dollars in? Tell them that I'm, I'm trying to pay something. Can you reduce my interest? Can you not? Again, please do not report me to the <laughs> to the credit bureaus. I'm trying to do something right in here. Work that debt snowball. All right. Really work it hard. Have garage sales. You know, get rid of the car payment. Yeah, get a, get, a, get a cash car, all right, and get rid of that big thing. List that smallest to largest, be in attack mode. It's all right. Sometimes you can't pay for anything, uh, everything during the month. But don't get scared 
and just not let them know because then things go into collections very fast and you cannot deal with the collector. Uh, they're just, they don't, it's, it's been sold. The debt has been sold to somebody else. And so now they're just taking it and they, and they bought it for a very small amount. And so now they can go after the full amount that you owe. So they don't, they have no, they don't care about you. They're just going to hassle you. Now, there is something called the Fair Debt Collections, Fair Debt Collections Act of 1978. This is illegal to use abusive tactics in collecting the debt. Can a debt collector call you at work? Yes, they can. Uh, but they cannot say, hey, Randy, why are you such a loser? You know, why are you such a loser uh, where you can't pay your bills? That they cannot do. And you can ask them not to call, and then they won't. Uh, but your debts are still owed. So the best way is always to be on the proactive side of this, letting them know what's happening. Maybe I lost a job. Things aren't going great. I am trying to pay my debts. I just want to, I'm being, you know, every month I'm calling you up and I'm, I'm sending you this much here. Is there a way that we can, you know, stop the interest? Is there a way we can do an offer and compromise? Okay. Uh, which means I'll pay half that debt and then we're done. There, there's all sorts of tactics that, that you can use, but not doing anything and just trying to forget about it. It's one of the worst things that we'll ever do. And that can it really affect you badly. So now we have some plans, my friends. We know how to start budgeting our money. We have some savings ideas with those automatic deposits and transfers every month. We have a way to build our credit score. All right, and now we have a strategy to manage our debts much, much better. And we don't want to stop there. Next video, we'll look at investing your money. All right, let's start growing our money. And how do I get that 12%? All right. Uh, well, stay tuned. Watch the next video. I hope, as always, you're making it a great day.